So um, you've heard, actually I really do enjoy these days, it's interesting, you know, I, I probably have been in the business longer than most of the speakers, but I can only um, say you've received some really good advice today. Uh, I heartily agree with many of the key points that have been uh, given, messages that have been given you today. So my experience is in um, the, the drug discovery uh, industry area, and I've worked, um, as you'll see in my presentation, both in big pharma and in biotech, and now I um, am semi-retired, but uh, work as an advisor more in the biotech mid-sized pharma area. Um, so I guess I'm sort of talking a little bit about pharma and how you can be entrepreneurial as well. So if I get through here. So I've had a very global um, journey in my career. It's all been drug discovery. Um, and you can see I was actually born and have a New Zealand passport. That's where I was educated, got a good education. But unfortunately, there was no drug discovery in New Zealand. Um, I, got a, I got a training because I did a degree in pharmacology. So this brought me to Switzerland to actually be able to make some drugs. And I started off as a postdoc in Sibagagi way back there. And I worked for more than 25 years in that organization, which changed its name three times. And then I got sick of it, um, and when my children were growing up, I decided to have a really big adventure, and I went to Singapore for five years to work for a biotech company. Um, and I'll go a little bit into that later, and then um, went back to Big Pharma to AstraZeneca in UK, where I lasted 18 months. And then my last job was actually here in Geneva, working for Genkeotex that you've just heard about, which was another approximately 18 months um, adventure. So, you know, I've covered most of this, so we can go through it quickly. I was born in, in Dunedin, I've trained as a pharmacologist. My first, I've talked to several of you during the lunchtime about how to start, and sometimes it's just getting your foot in the door. I got my foot in the door by taking a poorly paid postdoc position in the then Sibagaigi in Basel, even in a different therapeutic area than I'd done my PhD in, but it was a job, and I came with my husband to Switzerland for the idea we would stay for a couple of years and then go back to Australia or New Zealand. Here I am, still here, retired. So I worked there for 26 uh, years, and as I said, the, the company changed its name several times and is, is now Novartis today. And in that time, you know, things come and go, there are ma major strategic decisions, and this led me to actually working in two therapeutic areas, and cardiovascular is where I started, and then I ended up in the oncology area. And I started off as a lowly postdoc, but soon became a project leader, a group leader, and then ended up um, actually a senior manager in the research management board. And I put at the end there, I was a mentor, and I think this is an important thing. I've had leadership roles and in my time trained a lot of people. And it's actually something I enjoy, and I would put that on my list of accomplishments, not just train and just making drugs, but the fact that I've led to good careers of some young people. So it was a completely different transition to go to Singapore, which was a government-sponsored uh, biotech, um, and it's a very exciting experience because in five years we made six drugs ourselves. They were um, not um, new chemical classes. We were making best-in-class molecules. We made them very fast and we put them in development with a really small team of people. And this was the complete opposite experience to my experience in Big Pharma, where it took 25 years for my first drug to be, reach the market. So this was really quite exciting. And of course, to learn something about Asia and what's going on there was really interesting. There I was head of biology and the senior management team. And because it was a biotech, we had you know, quick decision making. We could do things really fast. And again, I had a great team of people that I was a mentor to as well. Then back to Big Pharma, two years with AstraZeneca in United Kingdom. It was a bit of a shock to go back to Big Pharma with lots of bureaucracy and processes, an enormous portfolio. Um, but again, I learned a lot of interesting things. 
There I was the head of the small molecule drug discovery. Um, and that, that only lasted a year before a new CEO came in, reorganized the company, and eliminated my position across the company, which I was actually quite happy about because I decided after my taste of biotech, that was the world I belonged best to. So that's when I came to um, Gen Keotex, the then CEO. Um, I was actually approached by a headhunter, but the CEO there turned out to be somebody I knew well from my early days in Sibagayagi and she convinced me to come down into Geneva and join this really interesting, scientifically interesting little company making NADPH oxidase inhibitors for the treatment of inflammatory and fibrotic diseases. And there I was the chief scientific officer. So now I am semi-retired and I only work part-time as a scientific advisor for a range of medium to small companies, um, several based in Switzerland, but it's global. Um, Europe and down under as well, where I am um, also on some scientific advisory boards for dr drug discovery units in academia. So through my career, you know, including my PhD, I have worked on many diseases which are listed here, so I kind of broad, a little bit like the first two speakers. I think I'm somebody that doesn't like to be too focused, but you know, have a broader overview of life. And in that time, I'm proud to say, well, I had two sons, and I've been talking to a lot of women over lunch about the difficulties of being a mother and having a career. It is not easy. It's tough, especially in Switzerland, where the daycare um, possibilities are quite limited and a, a school system where kids are off when you're working. It's not easy. But I survived, and I've got two sons who've survived very well and also scientists, although they're phys a physicist and an engineer, not, not in the biology field. And they're the same age as many of you in the audience, and of course, facing this stage in their life where they have to decide what to do, academia or industry. And then I've worked on many drugs. I've been a project leader of many projects or the leader of a department creating drugs. And the red ones actually made it to be registered. The green ones are still in development, and one purple one almost got there, got to phase three, and the yellow one actually is one of the genetic Keotex drugs that I hope is still alive and going into development. And I put on this slide the point that I felt through my career that the people that work with me were really important. I couldn't have had a successful career without them, all my postdocs, students, young people I hired did great science with me. They made my CV, the publication. So I think this is an important role. If you're a leader, you have to be a mentor and help people in their careers. So it's not true to go to academia and that you don't have to publish or, or do good science. And I have to agree wholeheartedly with Stephen with his comment that um, Novartis does very rigorous, good science, in fact, often better than ac in academia, where publications are often not reproducible because of such publish or perish pressure in industry. You have to have data that's totally reproducible. And you can publish. As I've said before, through my great teams and people I hired and had in my labs, I've been able to have a very good CV with lots of publications. And I guess maybe, I don't know if it's a highlight because it's not academia, but I did get featured once in Fortune magazine as the scientist behind a drug that Novartis had hoped was going to make them billions. It's the one that actually failed in phase three. And they published this article just before it failed. <laughs> so what is drug discovery and development? Well, an extremely long, complicated, time-consuming, expensive operation it can cost anything from half a, mil a billion to two billion dollars to bring a new drug to the market, which includes everything. And the costs are exponential. You see this funnel of the number of molecules that you start off and you end up with one. Well, the costs are the reverse of that. Um, it's enormously expensive. And big companies now are trying to make the process shorter and less expensive, but uh, it, it, it isn't getting less expensive. In fact, more and more money is getting 
spent, and I have a whole other presentation about how efficient this uh, process isn't um, and that we should be doing better. So as well as far as expertise, you've heard this already this morning, you need all kinds of people with different types of background. Um, there's many jobs in the various phases of drug development, right from target identification and to, to, to the phase that you go into clinical research. And even after a drug is registered, there's a whole department of people that look after a drug once it's registered. And yes, having a science background is a really good thing for all of these phases of drug development, there are jobs where someone with good analytical thinking, the training you've had in your university education is important. It's not the stuff you learn at university, that gets superseded anyway. It's, your, it's the process of being able to be a critical thinker that helps you in all of these jobs. So yeah, and I think one thing I have to emphasize here, drug discovery is all about multidisciplinary teams and I think I'll come to that, you have to be a good team player to do well in this situation. So you need people with all kinds of different backgrounds. So a little bit about, I've worked in big pharma, I've worked in biotech, and one has to decide where's the best place. And of course, when you're beginning um, your career, you could go to either. Big pharma, what's really great is you get fantastic training, specialised learning, lots of training opportunities. They, they train their people well, particularly the, the, the um, Basel companies are very good at training you. Access to amazing technology. When I think what I, what I had access to when I was there, it was fantastic. Um, it's fun working in multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. You heard before, if you want to learn something, work with people who don't do what you do, and you learn a lot. I've had the chance to work globally across cultures, and that's, I find, incredibly stimulating. You can start off in a lab, in a lab job, and move into another area. Some people have been asking me, how do you get your foot in the door? I mean, basically that's, well, I started as a lowly postdoc and it led to a job. I didn't transition to another area because I realized my love was research and I didn't want to be a project manager or be in the development organization. Um, but other people do that and they enjoy it. So you, you do have that possibility. You don't have to stay just where you start. What's not so good? You tend to be put in a specialist box, and I know many people who love to be a specialist, and they're quite happy in that box. I wasn't so much one of those people. There's many, many, many layers of management, and that's one thing that frustrated me a lot and why I really wouldn't want to go back to Big Pharma now. Um, too many, it's too slow, it's too much, you know, out of your control layers of management. And you don't get to know even the higher levels, you don't have contact with them. Very slow, too many meetings, bureaucracy and processes. They're all the same, all the companies. And this can quench your creativity. And promotion can take a long time. Sadly to say, you're more likely to get promoted if you change companies. That was my last point there. So biotech, so what's good? Flatter organisations, few layers, often no layers, very none. You see everything. You even see the business side, broad learning direct contact with upper management, fast decision making, rapid progress, more chance to have an impact or feel like you're having an impact. You're not just a tiny little cog where the machinery would even work if you fell out. And it's actually easier probably to get promoted. You know, well, there's very little layers, but it can get you to a higher position in another biotech quite quicker than as if you were progressing through Big Pharma. The cons, of course, is money. You don't have much money, very limited. Um, and actually, you're not getting a specialized training. You're getting a broad training. You're learning the, the, the tricks of the trade of doing a business, but you're not necessarily getting that specialized training in drug discovery, because many biotechs actually don't do it properly. They cut all sorts of corners. You're learning on the job. You're not getting the training. You, have, uh, you may not have access to good equipment. You have to go out begging and borrowing to get it. And you will depend on outsourcing um, to get everything done. And often the financial side is not so good, unless the company does well. And of course, you do brilliantly. But most of them fail. 
sadly. Companies can have a short life. So what do you have to have to be successful if you want to go into a drug discovery and tr um, uh, career? Well, in my opinion, you have to be interested in doing applied, re um, applied research. You don't go there because you want to make more money or whatever. That's, that's a myth. Um, well, the jobs are well paid, but you shouldn't be going into to them for that because you won't do well if that's all you're doing it for. You, have, you know, that's a desire to help patients, and I think that's you know what makes you feel good about the job. You do need creativity, although there are processes there that tend to stifle it. Um, and I think really important: you don't do well if you're a prima donna. You have to go in knowing that you've got to work with other people to be successful. I think it's really important to have a can-do attitude. This is your de determination, strong character, um, strong but not, not abrasive. Flexibility is absolutely important. Companies are changing all the time. The, the broader you educate yourself, the more you are flexible, the better you'll do. And be willing to learn new things. And I think really important, and I think I had plenty of it, was determination and perseverance. You've got to defend and fight for your projects. You do have to have some organisation skills that may be less important in an academic job. Um, if you don't organise yourself, you won't uh, succeed. And I think if people are looking at things um, to read, I think this is quite um, good. The eight traits that lead you to great success, I can agree with this. I think passion is absolutely important. You always have to work hard. You do have to do some degree of focusing. The push is basically you've got to have determination and keep going, and you see that also with the persist. You are serving, and you have to always remember that. So this is don't be arrogant, be humble, and you can always improve yourselves. And of course, creativity is important. And another point I want to make based on my experience is what you have to do. Are you doing what you enjoy every day? Don't do something just for the money. Do something because you're passionate about it. Because, you know, a lot of people just feel they have to have a job, and that's really wrong. And from birth, we're always pressured to improve ourselves. And yes, it is good to improve yourself, increase your knowledge, but find out what you're really good at and what you love doing. And this is called finding your strengths. And you'll do much better. You'll be much more productive if you're doing that. And you've even heard about that today, about people who haven't just followed what you would think is the right course or the straight path. They've followed finding what makes them really tick and what they enjoy doing. And if you, again, if you want to go into this a bit more, there's some good books I've got uh, here that you can look at um, about this. Some of you probably know your strengths already, but if you don't, I think it's quite good to do one of these exercises. There are tests you can pay for, but there are also free ones, and there's a link here to the six, six best um, tests you can do to try and find out what those strengths are that you possess. So if you do choose to go down the drug discovery route, it's probably going to be a global journey. Your work will have an application. You'll be doing something good, and it's kind of doing good globally when you make a drug. It's not just developed in one country. It's developed around the world. Your job will take you around the world. These days, companies all work in a very global way. And you work with people around the world, so you have that lovely cultural diversity, which I think makes work a lot of fun. But I think you have to keep in mind that it's a world that's changing. When I started out, it's a different world than it is today, the different technologies. So you have to be flexible, creative, flexible. You do have to work hard, nothing comes easy, and you have to be determined. And I think the comment is, if you fall, don't just stay down there. Pick yourself up, learn from that experience. Don't hold it bitter and twisted in your mind. Just learn from it and move on, and move on quickly, and have the determination to keep going at it. You'll find most successful people have fallen down holes, but they've been able to pull themselves out. And what I, you know, do encourage is the startup. You know, universities are the source of new ideas. And if you don't want to be a professor and you feel more entrepreneurial, then 
Switzerland is a good place. There are a lot of, a lot of support to take ideas and turn them into something um, with some commercial value. And you've heard some examples there. So thank you.